Hey folks, um, listen, I know you're probably getting tired of looking at my kitchen and so forth, but it's an interesting thing. Um, it's such a big project. It's so enormous that it's all I think about. It's all my wife thinks about. It's just constantly going on. And it is a lot of work. Oh my, holy hell, it's a lot of work. But we're making progress. So, yeah, once again, I'm going to kind of show you where we are right now. So, the big thing that we're preparing for right now is in a couple of days, we're going to get a new floor put in. Now, the new floor is not just in the kitchen. It's in pretty much the entire downstairs with the exception of one room. So, it has been a process of preparing the downstairs for the new floor. And <laughs> it's been crazy. So let's go ahead and take a look. So this is my family room. And yes, all the floorboards are out. All the furniture is out. All that sort of stuff. Because we need to rip up the carpet and of course prepare for the new floor the real big work has been well first in here in the kitchen the um in a kitchen there is a you know three eighths of an inch or whatever no quarter i don't know three eighths of an inch um sub flooring with um linoleum on top so we tore up all that sub flooring and lo and behold, there were two layers of linoleum underneath that subflooring. So that's pretty nuts. Um, I also came into my study. This is the study where I shoot all my nutshell brainery videos. So you'll recognize it from that. Well, I tore up the floor in here. And that included taking out a bunch of these, uh, oh, whatever, you know, the, the, the trim, and taking a sawzall and cutting all along here to take out all the old flooring. Really nuts. You can actually see down in here, that's the old flooring there. That's about as deep as I was willing to go to try to get that out so we took out all that floor took out all this flooring and then of course there was a bathroom so we had to take out all the sub flooring in the bathroom there and rip everything out. That was a real joy. And then in here, this was all tile. And oh my holy hell, this was, this was agony. I'm just going to say it. This was agony. Taking out all this tile and all the base stuff that the tile was on. Just awful. So now you may say, where's all your furniture? Well, it's in here <laughs> and we're not done yet we're loading up this room this is the one room where we're keeping the carpet it's a fairly new carpet this is the one room that we're not changing the flooring and so we're loading up all the furniture in there oh joy so let's get that button ready so there you go. This is my life for a while. Uh, quite something. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Yes. All right. We can go ahead and close this out. So we got all that going. I'm going to go ahead and get a pen ready. Um, hey, hope you're all doing well today. Um, gosh, we're getting toward the end, folks. Three weeks left, two weeks of lectures, then we prepare for the final. I am so going to take care of you on the final. So don't you fret about that at all. But uh, yeah, we're getting really close. Um, 
and I say this every time. I've been looking forward to this lecture. I love all these lectures. Um, I've been looking forward to this one because uh, this one, as have others, have has affected me directly. So I, I'd like to play with that. And so, well, what is the lecture? We get to talk today about economic bubbles. Okay, economic bubbles. You've heard of economic bubbles, no doubt. Um, and you may have a pretty good idea on what is an economic bubble. But today we're going to go deep into what it is, why it is, how they work, and how we can recognize them. Okay? And incidentally, knowing what they are, why they are, how they work, and how to recognize them won't help us at all. We're going to get into so many economic bubbles in our lifetime, it's going to be insane. We'll talk more about that as we go along, okay? So um, we're going to do a few readings today, but the main reading that we are going to kind of explore this through, hey, Andrea, and we got Laura with us as well, Scott and Brooke and Levi, of course, great to have you with us. Um, the main reading that we're going to look at is Tulip Mania, okay? Um, yes, speculative bubble. You know, um, Damien, you're absolutely correct. These are speculative bubbles. We're going to talk about that. Tulip Mania. Now, let me just go ahead and kind of give you the overall primer on Tulip Mania. Okay, so we're going to we're going to take just a moment and, and talk about tulips in the Netherlands. So tulips in the Netherlands. 1600s or so. Yeah, somewhere around there. Actually, I don't remember exactly. Do me a favor, guys, write in the uh comments there in the chat what years this generally was happening. Um I think it was around somewhere in the 1600s. Anyway, um in this time, the Netherlands, oh, they own it. They are doing fantastic. They are the tradesmen and, you know, trade and shipping. I mean, these folks are enormously successful in business, enormously successful in business. They have all the trade routes. They have all the boats. They have all the technology. They have all the education, all that. Well, you know, from our discussion of pecuniary emulation, what do you do when you're successful? You want to show it off. Remember, it's all about bling. We want others to perceive that we are successful and well off because then we'll have a place in the community and people will turn to us and we'll be trusted and our business continues to thrive and our influence continues to grow. You remember all that. Now, every society, every culture, every epoch has its particular way of showing off bling. Well, in the Netherlands, their bling was tulips. Okay? Now, you might say a frickin' flower. Well, you know what? <laughs> this is metal. A diamond is a rock. Why not a flower? If a rock can be bling, why can't a flower be bling? Okay? So, yeah, a flower. Just like anything else. Doesn't have to make sense in order for it to, to you know, connote um, success. So, but why tulips? And if it's going to be a flower, why not sweet, you know, alyssum or something like that? Um, well, okay, 1637. Thank you, Scott. I was right, 1600s. Okay, very good. So we're going to get a little thank you there. Um, so um, why tulips? Well, tulips are actually really, really finicky flowers, right? Um, so first of all, 
you know, you get these bulbs, right? You, and, and by the way, it's spring here in Utah. And so all of our tulips are starting to uh, bloom. It's kind of cool. You get these bulbs, you put them in the ground and, and they flower. But they only flower for a short period of time. Before long, they die, right? Furthermore, you can't just leave the bulb in the ground. You got to take that bulb out and really take care of it. And then bulbs only last for a few years. I don't know. Some bulbs last longer than others, but they don't just go on and on and on, right? They You only get a, you know, five, six, seven years of blooming out of these things. Um, and um, it was also really, really hard to kind of, you know, create these things, right? Um, but here's the big one. The, the, the tulips that were really, really, really valuable actually had a disease. They had a virus. And this virus caused these really cool kind of flaming colors to come up along the side of the tulip bulb, right? The flower itself. Um, they didn't really understand what this virus was or what was calling, causing these bands. But um, once a flower you know, showed these bands and so forth. Um, it could not be cloned. You could not cut it in half and create two and so forth. And it caused the life expectancy of that flower to just like plummet. So it was super, super, super rare and and very finite, right? Very finite and beautiful, highly desirable because it was really, really unique. All right. So They've got these tulips and they would show them off to the world to show how awesome they are. OK, so that's kind of the quick background of tulips. Um, by the way, we have uh, Damien here. Um, humanity adores pieces of material. Ain't that the truth? Um, some someday this is a nice and shiny and hard to get and it makes it extremely valuable. Real world example. Absolutely correct. Yeah, it, there's no real rhyme or reason to what we say is valuable, um, except maybe rarity. Well, the thing about those tulips, they were rare, especially those, those flaming ones, right? Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to go deep into tulips in this lecture, but we're going to go deep into something else. Yes, Scott, you have been waiting for this one. We are going to go deep into comic books, okay? And what I'm going to do is I am going to juxtapose the story of my journey through comic books with the tulip because both of these were economic bubbles and they follow the very same ingredients on what causes an economic bubble and what causes it to pop, all right? So... What's that? This is Wildcats number one. Jim Lee's Wildcats number one. If you know nothing about comics, you know nothing about this issue, right? But Scott, you know everything about this issue. You know that Jim Lee is one of the uh, creators who worked with Marvel, and he and a bunch of his other Marvel teammates and so forth, they defected from Marvel because they wanted to have more control over the creation. They wanted ownership of their characters. So Jim Lee and a bunch of Rob Liefeld and and uh, oh, what's his name? The guy who created Spawn, they all defected from Marvel and created Image Comics. And each one of them kind of created their own, you know, kind of, you know, characters and so forth. And they retained ownership of their characters. Uh, and uh, Jim Lee did Wildcats. This is number one. Tom McFarlane. That's right. That's right, Tom McFarlane. Well, that's Wildcats number one. I have that. I also have this. This is Wildcats number one, gold embossed cover, so you can feel it, signed by Jim Lee. Okay? Um, there's actually a little price tag there. When I bought it, I got it for seven dollars. 
there was a time where this comic was about $300. And now it's probably 30. I don't know exactly how much a gold embossed variant cover signed by Jim Lee of Wildcats number one is, is worth, but I think it's probably around 30 bucks. This really ties in a lot with our whole um, economic bubble journey. So let's play with this, right? Let's look at the ingredients of an economic bubble, all right? Okay, first thing, um, status symbol, right? Now, remember, these tulips were totally status symbols. It was pecuniary emulation. And remember, pecuniary emulation says, you have that and you're awesome, therefore I want it so some of your awesomeness can rub off on me, right? Remember that? Well, so all of these insanely successful people were, you know, filling their yards full of tulips and other people, the middle class, they want to be perceived as successful. Therefore, they fill all their yards with tulips and the lower middle class want to be perceived as upper middle class. And so they fill all their yards with tulips. Tulips is how you people know that you are successful. Um, Today, you know, you drive through certain neighborhoods and great, big, beautiful homes. Therefore, they are successful. My wife and I ask ourselves all the time, what do you do to live in that home up on Wasatch Boulevard? I mean, that's a that's a mansion. It's huge. It's a mini castle. What do you do to be able to afford that? Our homes are status symbols. Our cars are status symbols. Um, our shoes can be status symbols. Well, in this case, the tulips were status symbols. Well, a comic is a status symbol in the right circles, yes, right? So Scott has a, uh, a comic book company that he, he plays with and so forth, and he has always noted the comics that I have in the background here. That's because in his circle, in my circle, we recognize these things. We go, oh, wow, that's a so-and-so, so-and-so number, so-and-so, so-and-so. That is the first appearance of, or that is the origin story of. And so, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. In the right circles, this thing's a status symbol, right? Or at least it was. Okay, so that's the first ingredient is if you're not part of it, you're on the outside and you don't want to be on the outside. You want to be in the inside. FOMO, fear of missing out. No, no, you want this. Okay, second one, rarity, rarity. Okay, now remember I mentioned with these tulips that the ones that had the virus and they couldn't quite figure out what the deal was, but it made them so gorgeous and so rare. Um, those became really, really, really um, valuable, very expensive. Well, same thing goes with comic books. Now, I have a number one of this, the normal number one, but this one's more rare in theory. Hold on right? It's the gold embossed version, right? It's signed by Jim Lee. That's pretty darn rare. Well, here's the thing. Not really. So I have a couple of comic books behind me, uh, and we'll use them as examples in some others. I have, um, okay, X-Men number 12, right? Um, back in the 1960s. And then I have Vampirella, the Warren Vampirella, number one. Again, back in the 1960s, I think it was Warren Vampirella. That might be early 70s. Um, well, now, what makes these things rare? Well, first of all, comic books were not, in, in this day and age, comic books were not made to be kept. They were made to be wholly, wholly consumable. They were 
printed on really, really crappy paper with crappy techniques and just shoved into drugstores and comic books. They didn't even have comic book stores. They drug stores and so on and so forth. Kids would pick them up. They'd read them. They'd take them to school. They'd fold them, put them in their back pocket. They'd trade them and all kinds of stuff, right? And they would treat these things really poorly. And the paper is ready to fall apart anyway. So the reason these are rare is because... The vast majority of these have been destroyed, been totally destroyed, right? These weren't rare. They printed a bazillion of these things. And they were printed on really good paper, high quality and so forth. These were not meant to be bought by kids chewing gum, folding them in their back pocket and taking them to school and having the teachers take them away because it's a bad influence on you. These were made for adults. And so the vast majority of these that were printed still exist today. So there's a perception of rarity, but it's not real. A few comments here. Um, so... Uh, um, yeah. Oh, you do. All, Andrea does all that with houses. Yes, totally. Right. Um, it's crazy how, how how the housing market is going. It is so true. It's nuts. Right. Absolutely nuts. Um, hey, Damien points out a classic Ferrari is way more valuable than a new one. Rarity at its finest. Add up the parts and so on and so forth. Yes. OK, so we've got some great real world examples and some awesome comments there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So rarity is everything. And these things ain't rare, but we thought they were. OK, next one. Low supply, high demand. All right. Well, when it came to these tulips, especially the ones with the virus flame on them, the supply was really, really, really low. But demand was through the roof. Everybody wanted them. Everybody wanted them. And so when supply is low and demand is high, prices skyrocket. Really, really, really simple. Um, and it's the same thing with these comic books, right? The vast majority, and folks, I mean vast, I mean 99.999% of all comic books that were ever printed are worthless. They did not introduce new characters, or if they did introduce new characters, they went nowhere. There are no origin stories. There is nothing in there that made any sense or so on and so forth. They're just garbage, right? But the comics that are really valuable are either first editions, like this Vampirella, very first Vampirella, and therefore first Vampirella, first character, so on and so forth, or like this one, this X-Men is the first appearance of Joggernaut. So if you got a first appearance of a major character, or if you have um, the first edition of a comic book line that went somewhere, Vampirella, and depends on what circle you're in, or if you have an origin story, or if it's a storyline that was particular bit, particularly big and maybe made into a movie and so forth, um, then, then it's rare, right? And supplies are really, really low, but demand is high. Um, Lawrence says, reminds me of gas prices, how they dropped last year when no one was driving. Yes, classic supply and demand, Laura. Classic supply and demand. Okay, very good. Um, Scott, uh, and then made an appearance as an MCU movement movie and the value skyrockets. So true. By the way, the thing that's really extraordinary about the MCU, the Marvel comic universe, right? Um, those characters, Iron Man, Thor, Doctor Strange, um, Hulk, and and Falcon, and all those those guys, um, Captain America, they were considered the B squad. Marvel back in the day got into a real fix. They went bankrupt. I know because I owned Marvel stock and lost it all. Um, 
Marvel sold the rights to their top line characters, their A squad. So they sold the rights to Spider-Man. They sold the rights to X-Men and so forth. And they kept their B squad because who wants to buy Captain America? That is so passe. Um, Iron Man? Nobody knew about Iron Man. And yeah, look at what happened now. It's fascinating. Okay, let's keep going. Um, speculation. Okay, Damien said this earlier, right? Speculative bubble. This is the most important aspect of a bubble. They're all important, but this one, ooh, this one. Speculation is when you buy something not with the intent of using it, but because you think it's going to go up in value and you think you can resell it. That is speculation. I speculate that the value of this thing will go up. Therefore, I'm going to buy it, sit on it, and then resell it, right? Yes, Scott, you're right. Um, yeah, <laughs> then they got it back. Um, so here's the thing with speculation. Um, I have, and you're going to see some of them, Image was putting out a new number one of a new character set and a new series every month. Every month was a new number one. And my, my wife and I decided we're going to buy every single number one. And not only are we going to buy every single number one, we'll buy like five or six of every single number one. And we're going to sit on them because they're going to go up in value, man. That's speculation. Um, when they were buying, the, for example, with the tulips, folks would buy tulips. They wouldn't even take delivery on it. They would just take the ownership paper and then wait a week and then sell that ownership paper because it goes up in value. That's pure speculation. All right. So you're not buying it to use it. You're not buying it to enjoy it. You're not buying it for any of those reasons. Um, Pure speculation. So, for example, in the comic book world, and Scott, you can tell me what it is. You know, when they take a comic and they put it in a, you know, hermetically sealed, all completely, you can't open it container. Therefore, you know the thing in there is a 9.5 quality. You can't even open that comic. You're not buying it to read it. Read it. Who reads these things? You buy it with wholly the intent to one day resell it, okay? Um, yes, okay, Dylan, um, it's like people who buy a Rolex, never wear it, um, and stick it in their safe to resell it. That is 100% a great example of speculation. Yeah, professional grading, the CGC encapsulation. Thank you, Scott. Dylan, that is is absolutely... Um, speculation. All right. Um, I heard about, oh, I watched this car show one time where somebody had like a car from the 1970s. Um, and, uh, oh, Damien, we're going to Bitcoin. You know, we're going to Bitcoin. Hold on to that. I watched this car show from, and somebody had this classic car from the 1970s. I forget what it was, but it only had 11 miles on it. 11. That was caught. That was for speculation. Bitcoin is 100% speculation. Kind of, right? 99%. We'll talk about that. Okay. So speculation. Then we've got stockpiling. Now, in the case of, of the, um, what do you call the tulips? Right. OK, here's what's happening. People buy all this stuff on spec, on speculation. So they buy it and buy it and buy it. But they don't want to put it on the market yet because they want the prices to go up. So they stockpile them. They have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tulips 
and they're just going to um, the Hunt brothers with their silver in the 1980s. Yes, um, they're just going to and, and we'll get to the celebration here in a moment. I want to keep going with this, but don't worry, we'll get it. Um, so they just load up all this stuff, right? And so since all these tulips are being stockpiled, that means they're not on the market, which means the tulips that are on the market are worth more because supply is low, right? See what I mean? Um, but that stuff is out there. Now, I want to show you this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work for us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open this up. Give me a moment. We'll make this work. We're going to go ahead and start. Oh, we'll do a different. Don't worry, guys. We're going to make this work. I see. Has a number changed there? Maybe. Come on. We can start that. Cancel. I really want to do this, guys. So give me a moment. I'm going to come on over here. We're going to start it there. Start. Oh my gosh, why is that AP address failing? I'm going to try it one more time. 194. Oh, it's not going to do it. That's a real shame. Yeah, real shame. Okay. I just got to try it one more time. <laughs> one, you're killing us. Okay, so I'm going to start there. I'm going to open that AP. Okay, 94, 94. Nope. Okay. What I was going to do, guys, is I was going to use my lawn cam and take you downstairs to show you my boxes upon boxes upon boxes of comics. That's my stockpile. And you know what's included in my stockpile? Another one of these. I own two of these. That is pure speculation and stockpiling. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Laura, you're right. Uh, let's see. Guns now and so forth in the pawn shops. Got, uh, dogs and cats. During quarantine, yeah, is now giving them back because I don't want to take care of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know what that does, guys? We're going to bring this on up and we're going to go ahead and do our celebration, right? You guys, and I haven't even done the whole question thing, and you guys are really into this. And so let's do our timestamp of 1028, all right? 1028, go ahead and send me after the lecture an email with 1028. And you know the drill. I take care of you because you're taking care of me. Okay. I'm sorry, my lawn cam won't work. All right, let's keep going. All right, futures. All right, futures. Sure, Jack, you can do it now. Futures. Futures are fascinating. Um. I don't even have to buy the tulip anymore. Futures are basically betting. I'm sorry, it's it's fancy betting, right? And um, futures are saying, I think the prices of these tulips are going to go up. And somebody else says, I think they're going to go down. And so they are buying against the future price of an item. Right. And so the person who the prices go up, um, he or she gets a, a, a payment because you're right. Prices went up. Um, you you help support this with your future purchases and so forth. So here you get money. Somebody else says, oh, I think they're going to go down. I'm going to downgrade the stock. And then when prices go down, it's like, yeah, you're right. They were bad investments, so on and so forth. Now, the grand example of this um, right now is um, GameStop, right? People were betting against GameStop and so forth on the futures of it. So now we're not even trading in tulips. 
we're trading in the future possible price of tulips. We are getting further and further away from an actual item. All right. Um, no regulation. No regulation around this. OK, um, this was just going nuts, all this tulip mania. And there was very little regulation around how much you can invest, what you know you needed to invest and so forth. People were literally, and I'm not making this up, they were mortgaging their house to get you know $100,000 so that they could buy futures against speculative prices on tulips. There is, the, this is just going insane, right? And then low, buy-in. Now, the nice thing about, say, futures is um, you don't have to actually buy the tulip. You don't have to actually buy the price. You can just buy a future on it, or you can buy a part of it as well, right? Um, case with comic books, $7 for this fancy schmancy one. That's low buy-in. I can be part of this comic book craze. And trust me, in the 90s, oh my gosh, the comic book craze was nuts. It was just nuts. Um, very, very inexpensive to buy in. <clears throat> and the same thing with tulips. Sure, you can't buy the big, huge, amazing, you know, fiery virus ones, but you can at least buy into the, the futures and so forth. And so everybody was in on it. Um, now, this is one of these things of where, you know, this is one of the arguments that Wall Street makes with, with apps like Robinhood and so forth is, well, these folks, they might lose everything. Now, we are all rich, right? We're Wall Street. We're rich. We can invest a million dollars, lose it overnight, and we don't feel it because we're part of the one percenters. But these middle class people, oh, no, no, no. We can't have them investing because they might lose it all and they don't really understand it and it's not sophisticated. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, OK, you're really trying to keep the wealth to yourself. I get it. But still, with a low buy in, people are buying in who should not be buying in. OK. Now, here's the burst of the bubble. At some point, somebody looks around and goes, holy crap, what are we doing? We're spending $30,000 on a plant. And there's so much supply out there. Sure, it's all stockpiled. People have it stockpiled. But if you actually look at how much is out there, not just what's on the market right now, but if you look at how much is out there, we are way oversupplied. And frankly, I think we've gone too far with all of this. And so prices start to drop. Well, people are like, oh, holy hell, I can't I, I have I have a million dollars invested on all this, and I'm in debt up to my eyeballs to have bought that million dollars worth. I've got to sell this right away while it still has some value. Well, you're not the only one thinking that. Everybody's thinking that. And so as a result, prices plummet. I mean plummet, right? One day this is worth $300. The next day it's worth 30 And right now, I don't know what it's worth. Probably the $7 that's written there. Maybe not. Beanie Bubbies, bunnies, Beanie Babies is another great example of a bubble. Beanie Babies, Cabbage Patch Kids. You guys don't remember all these things, but we have our own, right? We'll get to Bitcoin. So rush to sell, prices plummet, all right? And then your bubble bursts. It's over. Okay, so that's kind of the life cycle and causes of a bubble. Now, I want to show you some real-world examples. OK, let me show you a couple of real world examples. And we're going to look at the fingerprint of a bubble. Remember what I just said. We're going to look at the fingerprint of a bubble. 
this right here is the tech boom and bust bubble of 2000. Now, I know that's a long time ago. You maybe weren't even born or you were that big and so on and so forth. But back at this time, the Internet was brand new, brand new. And if nobody knew what it was, nobody knew how it was going to work. It was a brave new world to the umpteenth degree. I don't think you can appreciate unless you were there how revolutionary this thing was that you guys have just grown up with. Well, this is Intel stock, Intel that makes the chips. And this is Intel stock. Now, mind you, during this climb, not only was it going way, way, way up. Um, and I remember with my brother, yeah, he thought you were thought he was lying to you. I love it. Not only was this going up, that stock price was doubling like every three to six months. So not only is there this huge growth trajectory, that's with the stock price doubling, which means had it not doubled, it would be even higher. Okay. Because this was big, people. Well, see that red line right there? Let me tell you what that red line is. That's the day I was hired with Intel. Intel recruited me to be part of their marketing firm and the marketing side. I signed on. And the day I hired, I, I'm not making any of this up. It's right there. They, they said, okay, we're hiring you on. Here's your stock package. This is, and that was part of a regular thing when you hire on with Intel. And what I did, folks, is I looked at the previous 15 year, 20 year history of Intel. And I looked at how much the stock price had gone up and I looked at all how the stocks had doubled. And I calculated that I could retire a multimillionaire by the age 55, okay? Because we, had this just kept going on up for another 20 years, I'd be a multimillionaire at the age 55. I'd retire and move to Venice. Well, I'm 55 years old, guys. I'm not retiring. Now, don't get me wrong, Intel treated me well. But that's because of this. The bubble popped. I can't tell you how much our hearts broke <laughs> as we saw this slow, slow, slow decline. Here we were looking forward to retiring with, you know, $300 million by the time we're 55. And over the next few years, we see our dreams shatter. Oh, that was hard. Okay, that's a bubble. All right, well, now, what about the housing bubble of um, 2008 or so? Um, Laura, you might know a little bit about this. Well, everybody was getting mortgages because, yeah, I mean, it's just this huge, huge, huge housing boom going on. And so people were buying homes. People had two or three homes and they, you could buy them with zero down. How would you like to buy a $400,000 home with zero down? And the mortgage so low, it was insane. You'd do it and you'd buy several because you're on speculation. I'm not gonna live in that home. I just know that housing prices are gonna go up because housing prices always go up. So I'm gonna buy three of these things and sell them, right? Laura says, I actually sold my home during that time frame and got a great payout. My sister then sold months later and had to pay to get out of it. Oh, Laura, I'm so sorry. Well, let me show you this one. Remember that, that fingerprint I told you about? When a price goes up like that, that is a freaking bubble. That's a bubble. Look at that price, right? Well, this first red line here is when my father 
who had a million dollars of his own, took out a loan for another two million dollars or something like that, and built a massive luxury home in Telluride, Colorado. All right. He went out there, bought it, so on and so forth. I mean, built it. And so he put a million of his own dollars and like two million or one million or whatever of the bank's dollars into this home. This red line is when he finished building it. The home was now worth a fraction of what he put into it, right? Um, oh, yeah, Cottonwood, that's right. Um, a fraction. It took him many, many, many years to sell it at like 30% of what he owed on it. So he has to pay to get out of it, right? Pay to get out of it. Just awful, right? So these are two bubbles that I've lived through. So the comic book bubble, the internet bubble, and the the that was the dot-com bubble, and then the housing bubble, right? Um, let's see. Well, let me get out of the way. Yeah, I can't get out of the way enough. All right, so you see the bottom there. Now you see the top. All right. This is Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin. So, oh gosh, maybe I can make these invisible for a moment. I can make these invisible for a moment. Hold on, folks. No, we'll get there. We'll get there. There we go. Invisible for a moment. Check this out. Bitcoin worth nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, it zooms up. Everybody's going to buy it. Oh, now it comes back down. Okay. Oh, it zooms up. Oh, it starts to flatten out. Oh, my holy hell. It's now up here. Now, that is the fingerprint of a bubble. Now, the reason it shot up like that, by the way, is because Tesla came along and said, hey, we're going to start accepting Bitcoin. Now, here's the thing about Bitcoin. Now, I want to be clear. Bitcoin is either the greatest collective scam we have ever perpetrated upon ourselves, or it is the future of economics and money and commerce. Which is it? I don't know. It'd be nice to know. Nobody accepted Bitcoin. And so all the, and nobody real, come on, I know there's one or two people that would, but the vast majority of people who accepted Bitcoin were on the dark web, okay? So the only reason Bitcoin was worth anything is because of speculation. We think it's going to be worth something, therefore we're going to buy it and then sell it later on. And so everybody knows every somebody who made money on Bitcoin. And you go, oh, gosh, is it too late to get in? Is it too late to get in? FOMO, fear of missing out, so on and so forth. And you hate yourself for having missed it, right? You know, up here, you, you've, you think that maybe you missed out and so you don't buy. And then it goes down and you're so glad you didn't. But then you, you know, maybe you bought down here and it goes up, but then you didn't sell and it goes back down. And so then you sell and then it goes, you go nuts with it, right? But then Tesla came along and said, we'll accept Bitcoin. This changed everything, everything. This is now a legitimate, real, proper company that will is willing to sell a real product with Bitcoin. And so the value of it has gone way, 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 way high. But the thing is, nobody wants to spend Bitcoin because they think it's going to go up. In other words, they're stockpiling it. People buy Bitcoin not to use it, but to stockpile it on speculation. Damien, some professional athletes are requesting their new contracts to be paid in Bitcoin, too. Fascinating. I did not know that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. 
Now, here's the thing, though, guys. Um, and by the way, I'm just going to take this up because I know it's in there somewhere. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Mario, how many cryptocurrencies are there? I mean, there are, I think, hundreds. Aren't there hundreds of kind of cryptocurrencies? Didn't Facebook start a cryptocurrency? Somebody do me a favor and Google how many cryptocurrencies are there and let us know. Because here's the thing. Bitcoin gets all the press. But who says it's going to be on top? It's just a speculative bubble. It is just a speculative bubble. Now, where's the bubble going to burst and where is it going to even out? I don't know. It's not like it's going to have zero value. Intel's bubble burst, and yet it evened out, and it's a very valuable company. And and the housing market bubble burst, but it's not like houses lost their value. Houses are still very valuable and it's more level and now going back up. Bitcoin bubble will burst, but that doesn't mean it's going to be valueless. It just means it's going to come down, level out and get to something normal. Andrea, 4,000. Anybody with chain blocking technology can start a cryptocurrency. So I could start one. So mm, this is a bubble. OK, over 8000. Wow. See, we don't even and it's probably changed from 4000, 8000 in the time that Andrea did her search and Mario did his. It's easy to start a cryptocurrency. Anybody can do it. All you need is the blockchain software. It's just getting people to uh, buy it from you on speculation and then stockpile it. Now, I want to be clear. Bitcoin will not lose all its value. It will come down and it'll level out, level out to something normal. But notice Janet Yellen of the Reserve now, and actually now I think she's Secretary of Commerce or what. I forget what she is now, but she used to be the Reserve Chairman, but now she's with the with the Biden administration, she says we need more regulation around it. That's going to come down. Okay, let's keep going. So, fascinating stuff. Would you invest in Bitcoin? We're not going to open this up. Normally, I do a um, I do a uh, anonymous survey on this. I did not set up the anonymous survey, um, but it's always interesting to see what folks say. Now, here's the thing, though. <clears throat> it's really easy to say, <clears throat> excuse me, that Bitcoin isn't real. And it's true, it's not. Bitcoin is just an idea. It's just an idea. Um, ones and zeros controlled by a blockchain and... If you think you know how blockchain works, you're lying to yourself. Even the guy who invented it, we're not sure who he is or where he is and what he does. It's all very mysterious, the inventor of the blockchain. You can understand it mathematically, but it's 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 weird. Um but you know what? Money isn't real either. We talked about this right? There is no such thing as money. All money is, is a medium by which we've all agreed on Scout's honor to honor. Money has value because we've agreed it has value. Therefore, my dollar bill is no more or no less real than a Bitcoin, okay? Now, the way we kind of see this you know, one of the readings that came up was the travels of Marco Polo, right? I'm just going to give you one little slide on this. This is all you need. But I'm connecting it with Bitcoin, right? You know, one of the things that, that Marco Polo said while in China is, in China, paper money had value because the ruler declared that it could be used as a means of payment. The Bitcoin has value because 
Elon Musk declared that it can be used as a means of payment. That is a level of faith in a Bitcoin that had not heretofore been available to us. That's why it skyrocketed. Weirdly, a form of alchemy turning common trees into valuable money, said, what's his name, Marco Polo. He called it alchemy because all you have to do is turn a piece of paper and, you know, hold up a piece of paper and be a ruler and say it has value. And everybody says, oh, it has value. It's the same thing with the Bitcoin. Elon Musk says, oh, it has value. And everybody, oh, it has value, right? Um, well, there's another reading that you had, and we're staying with the Bitcoin thing here, about the economic organization of a POW camp. And one of the things that was fascinating about this reading is that the main form of currency was cigarettes. They were used as currency, okay? Well, why they're used as currency is pretty straightforward. It's interesting. So all the cigarettes would come into the POW camp through the Red Cross packages. So why aren't people just stockpiling cigarettes and inflation goes skyrocketing, right? If there's more and more cigarettes in the POW camp, then inflation goes up because there's more cigarettes, right? Well, people smoked them. You know, the addiction to nicotine pretty much ensured that there was going to be more or less a constant level number of cigarettes in a POW camp. Because as they'd smoke them, more supply would come in through the Red Cross packages, right? Um, Bitcoin and their, their uh, blockchain has a technology that in theory, will ensure that there's always a set number of Bitcoin units, right? Now, Mauricio, maybe you know the, the answer to how many Bitcoins are there. But, you know, like a dollar, it can be parsed out in quarters and nickels and dimes and pennies and blah, 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 blah right? Um, but that, in theory, is what makes a... a um, a Bitcoin valuable because there's a finite number and now somebody has said it has value. But it's still a bubble. Now, bubble doesn't mean it's worthless. Intel's not worthless. My home's not worthless. But both dropped. Okay. So there you go. There's our discussion of economic bubbles brought to you by Tulips comic books, and Bitcoins, all right? Um, so thank you very much. I hope this was interesting. Uh, by the way, if you want any moral to this lesson, I've been stung by three different bubbles, and I will be stung by three more in my lifetime, and you too um, will be stung. Mauricio, don't really follow crypto. You invest mostly in stocks. By the way, I think that's really smart. Stock actually has value. Yes, there's speculation and there's futures and all that sort of stuff, but it's attached to an actual company that produces goods and services. Or is Bitcoin? Yeah, better, better to stay in the market. All right. All right, everyone, shoot me that email and um, have a fantastic day. As usual, I'll stick around if you have any questions. Otherwise, um, you guys have an absolute. Have a fantastic week. I hit the button too soon. <laughs> we'll see you later.